welcome to the Arts Hour on Tour. It's Christmas and it's Hanukkah, and I'm on stage at the wonderful Cinematek in West Jerusalem, Israel, with live music, live comedy, and a live audience. <laughs> The music you're hearing is Israeli hip-hop funk band Hadag Nahash. More from them later. I'm Nikki Beatty, and just as we do every month for the Arts Hour on Tour, we're bringing you the best from the arts and culture scene here. And as always, we'll be tapping into local issues and the hottest trends. Jerusalem's one of the oldest cities in the world. Its name resonates in the hearts of Christians, Jews, and Muslims alike, who all have centuries of shared history here. We're in West Jerusalem, the predominantly Jewish part of the city. Across the Green Line, East Jerusalem is more Palestinian. And a bit like Christmas, the city means different things to different people. Amazing guests on the show today. Jerusalem-born Leo Raz is here. He's the creator, writer, and star of the Israeli TV blockbuster Fauda, now streaming around the world on Netflix, and I loved it. Palestinian rapper Mohammed Mugrabi, a.k.a. Jabid, a conscious rapper raising awareness about all kinds of issues through his music. We have comedian Benji Lovett. He's a regular on the English-speaking Israeli comedy scene here in Jerusalem. And we have Apo Sagian, frontman of the band Apo and the Apostles. Also with me are Itai Mautner, who is the artistic director of the Jerusalem Season of Culture, Riman Barakat, too, works with the season. She liaises with the Palestinian community. And that's not all. Shifra Kornfeld is here. She's a novelist and a winner of Israeli Big Brother, the reality TV series. Now, a question for all of you first. This is only the fifth time in 111 years that Hanukkah and Christmas have coincided. And December marks the birthday of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, but also significant that the Prophet Isa, that's Jesus, is there for Muslims, as is the whole nativity. We've also just had winter solstice. So what does this time of the year mean to you? Ita, I'm going to come to you first. Well, I think we should celebrate all the customs and religions that you talked about. But for me personally, the most brilliant and most touching thing for us to celebrate is now, the present, us sitting together, people from all over Jerusalem, connected in one space together. So I think we should raise a toast for that. Thank you. Apo, you're from the Armenian quarter here in Jerusalem. What happens there? At this time of the year, we usually, the community comes together, a lot of emphasis on the family, and there's a lot of drinking going on there. A lot and, of uh, drinking. Yeah, because we celebrate Christmas three times a year in Jerusalem. <laughs> what? <laughs> As Jerusalem, as the Armenians in Jerusalem are, are the only Armenians that celebrate Christmas on January the 18th. So until then, we do December 25th with the Christians. Yeah. January 6th with the Orthodox and in Armenia, which they do as well. And then January 18th. Fantastic. Yeah. Shifra, you were raised in an ultra-Orthodox Jewish family in the old city of Jerusalem. What happens there? It really just boils down to a lot of candle flames because <laughs> I come from a family of eight, and in my house, the menorah lighting is one of the few mitzvahs that are very inclusive. Everyone can do them, women, children, and my father made sure we each had our own menorah, <laughs> and by the time we reached the eighth candle, it was really a lot of candles, and every single window in the house had a lot of candles in it, and it was really very festive. And Riman, what happens in your household? or what, How do you celebrate this time of year? I celebrate everything, you know. <laughs> I, I'm the typical or non-typical Muslim East Jerusalem woman who will celebrate Christmas and light a Hanukkah candle and then eat the sweets on the Prophet's birthday. Very good. <laughs> uh, Jabed, you're from Shuafat, the refugee camp in East Jerusalem. Tell me about what you do. Well, there's nothing much to do in the refugee camp, really. 
But at this time of the year, young people like me like to go to parties in Ramallah or Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem, doesn't matter. And everyone hopes that the next year will be better. So you reflect on things. Yeah. Leo, what about you? In my family, we have Hanukkah, so, uh, and I have three kids, and they love to light the candles. But in the morning, we're traveling to Nazareth. It's in the north, and we're celebrating the, um, the Christian holiday there. Shannon, can I ask you? Yeah, although I'm not a religious man at all, I am aware that I live in one of the most beautiful cities in the world. During the holiday season, things become a little bit more beautiful here, and that's great. I love it. Well, live music on the Arts Hour stage now. Show some more appreciation, if you will, for Hadag Nahash and their track, Shir Nahama. <laughs> Whoa, whoa, splendid, did you say? Um, your fans are singing every single word of that. Give me the sense of what that song means. I guess the main theme is that uh, things get tough where we live, mm. but we still need to have hope and party, dance, whatever. Good, Feel so good. it's life affirmative. Yes. Very good. Thank you so affirmative. much. Affirmative. The answer to that is affirmative. Affirmative. Very good. <laughs> 
You're listening to The Arts Hour on Tour. We're on stage at the Cinematheque in Jerusalem, a building overlooking the walls of the old city. And as always, I've already taken our culture cab ride to discover the artistic secrets of the city. Itai Meltner was my guide. Taxi? Hello, Itai. Good morning, good morning. Is this what you imagined when you heard the word Jerusalem? No, I have a, a sort of biblical image of what Jerusalem is. When we talk about that, we re really talk about the old city, which is only one square kilometer that is divided into four different quarters. We have everything that you need when you talk about monotheistic religions. Okay, so if you are a Christian, if you believe in Christianity, then you have the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where Lord Jesus is, is buried. And when you talk about the Islam religion, then we have the Dome of the Rock where Muhammad ascended into heaven. And when you look about Judaism, well, we have the Wailing Wall, which is one of the walls of the first and the second temple that we had. And it's still a place where you want, if you want to ask something for God, then you write it on a small piece of paper and you shove it into that old wall and maybe it will come true. The last quarter that we have in the old city is the Armenian quarter. Very small community, very important community. And I think they became famous I mean, worldwide, when Kim Kardashian and her husband Kanye West came to baptize their child in the Armenian church. So where are you taking me now? I can't tell you it's a secret, but we are moving <laughs> from the eastern part of Jerusalem to the western part of Jerusalem. It's going to be a beautiful ride. Check out on your left-hand side right now. This was one of the places that the International Palestinian Art Biennale took place. It took place in Jerusalem, in Jericho, in Kalandia, and many, many other places. So what kind of artists were actually exhibiting at the Biennale? Well, there were local artists and also international artists. It was curated by a very important curator from Australia, and it was a very, very big uh, success. And it was the beginning, it was the starting steps of this beautiful and very important Palestinian art scene that is going on in Jerusalem and around it. So I've heard, Itai, that Machne Yehuda, the market, is the center of all cultural life for Jerusalem. Is there any truth to this rumor? Yes, it's true. From a place that only sells groceries and meat and parsley, it became a very vivid nightlife scene. So this is the market, Itai, and what I see are magnificent aubergines and beautiful fruit and vegetables. What else happens here then? Well, just now look at these closed shutters of the shops that we're looking at right now. You see this beautiful graffiti, but it's Jerusalem vibe graffiti, which means that what you see in front of your eyes are two amazing biblical scenes. So this is like, it's the whole door entrance of a shop but it is now a massive canvas with the most vibrant colors. And also the artist Solomon Souza has tagged his name at the bottom of each of these doors. By the way, we're looking now at two, but when you walk here at night, it's like an open air gallery. It's beautiful. There are around like 60 or 70 different portraits over here. And when you come here at night, this is a center for live music. You'll hear Kurdish music, Iranian music, Persian music, Yemenite music, Arabic music, Yiddish songs, whatever, all the different places that people from Jerusalem came from, you'll hear their music played live here. Very, very vivid and a must place to be. The Culture Cab in Jerusalem with Itai Mautner. Thank you for that, Itai. So we're in Jerusalem, which is known to so many people as the holy city. And the name says it all, really, doesn't it? So I want to know what the challenges are to arts and artists living here. And I'm going to come to you first, Shifra. What sort of challenges do you think artists and creative people face? Well, I can answer for myself. I write, and I find more and more that I write about Jerusalem, and I want to take apart and put back together different aspects of my experience um, growing up here. And for me, you know, in Jerusalem, we talk about the earthly Jerusalem, and then there's a more Heaven. ephemeral, heavenly Jerusalem, like oh. Yerushalayim Shel Mata and Yerushalayim Shel Mala. As long as I was here, living here, dealing with the actual grind of living in the city, I couldn't do anything with it. And I had to leave to gain perspective and look back at it as something that art can be produced from. And do you think that, that it can be produced from these situations? 
it has to be produced from these situations because art comes from that pressure and conflict. Art always has to have tension in it to be interesting. Apo, you're here without your band, the Apostles, tonight. You live in the Armenian quarter of Old Jerusalem. The four of them live in Bethlehem. Explain how that affects you as a band, would you? Well, it affects us in the means of accessibility. They would like to be here, but they can't because they need to apply for the permits, and that takes a while, and they didn't get it, but they might get it next week because of the holidays. But it's always a black cloud, this lack of accessibility. It's proximate, but yet it's distant at the same time. But our band tries to overcome that. So Bethlehem is six miles away. That's all, isn't it? It's ten minutes away ten minutes in away. my driving. <laughs> <laughs> what sort of audiences do you attract? Uh, an audience that does not want to be defined by politics or by agendas. I don't want to sound like a tree hugger, but like, uh, but like an audience that does want to... Uh, just have a good time on a Saturday night. Riman, let me come to you. What sort of challenges do you face as a creative person in this city? Well, for the most part, Jerusalemites, or maybe, maybe people in East Jerusalem, are very serious. And somehow the politics tends to determine the kind of art that is being produced. And so the challenge is really to just stand back and go beyond the labels that are present in the city and to, to be the person that, that I just want to be. Ita, I'm going to come to you. First of all, I must say that I a little bit think differently than my friends here. I mean, I don't want to part, only party and to go away. Apa was talking about a black cloud. Uh, Shifa was talking about this conflict and all these problems. I think that's what makes the cultural narrative in Jerusalem so special and much more different and unique than all the cultural narratives that you have in other cities in the world. You know, parties and young stuff and beautiful stuff, you can have everywhere. But here, we're situated in Jerusalem. The cultural narrative that comes out of Jerusalem Jerusalem is a very unique and a very site-specific, or if you wish, a city-specific. And I want to deal with that. Give me an example. I want to go to what, where we went today. I want to see the heavy metal band into an ultra-Orthodox neighborhood. I want to listen to Apo's problems bringing his musicians from Bethlehem here, because that makes this music much more complex and much more interesting. May I respond to Itai and just say that I agree with you as a consumer or a spectator, but I think that living here... I would need what my friends who still live here need, which is escapism. Escapism is part of the game, which is okay, but I don't want to go around the problems. I want to go into the problems and see if art and culture can affect the problems and bring better solutions. Mohammed, what do you think are the challenges that you face in a city like Jerusalem? Yeah. I would like to say, as an artist that comes from a Palestinian refugee camp in Jerusalem, I face this challenge not to, to offend anybody by my lyrics. You know what I mean? I don't want to, in any uh, performance of, of me in West Jerusalem or uh, in Ramallah or Tel Aviv to, to go on stage and some people be angry or not like what I say. This is a very challenging thing for me as a performer. And you have this fear of communication and the language barrier between the Arabic-speaking people and the Hebrew-speaking people, and it's very complicated. So you're putting it down to a language divide? Yeah, language and politics. It, it, there's this stereotypes of people. People are scared from me because I'm, I'm a Palestinian refugee, and uh, when I start speaking, they, some people get scared. What do you think they're scared of? Me, speaking Arabic, being from a refugee camp. We're not scared of you. Leo Raz, well said. Not. Well said. <laughs> Thank you all for that. Um, more live music here on the Arts Hour stage in Jerusalem now. Apo Sagian, you're going to perform Yalla Dance. Apo Sagian, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> There's a ruin in my country, a bloodbath on the way, a midnight that is coming to sigh the end of days. 
I want to go back there to my love Wherever she may sleep Find with whom she's warmed up to And steal her back to me Remind her of our days The golden plants we made How easy they broke down The moment when we left Yellow baby dance Don't say maybe Yellow baby dance On the Zaytun tree Yellow baby dance Don't say maybe Yellow baby dance On the Zaytun tree If my skinny bones can't stand the weight of our lost chance I'll carry you in silence And gaze to distant lands Where I'll reach down my hands Built a home we never had Just wait for the fire to pass And leave us in a sea of ash Gather wood for the night Since you've lost the warmth I gave You moved on and left it behind Where it burns in an empty space Yellow baby dance, don't say maybe Yellow baby dance on the Zaytun tree Yellow baby dance, don't say maybe And there goes the country in the fiery ball of red. Gone with it are the old words of a depth I never meant. And if there be a new sky, the bluest may it be, I'll carry you in silence. And wish you back to me. Aposagian, everyone, and Yalla Dance. Don't go away, there's lots more to come, and the Arts Hour on tour in Jerusalem is back after this. This is the BBC World Service. Before the news, a quick word from the Newsday team. If you've not listened before, we talk to people right round the world. It's proactive in the sense that we're looking forward. And we just try to explain what's going on in a way that I think is easily accessible. You hear the presenters, but also behind the scenes, Newsday is made up of an international team of journalists. And it means that we can, in a single half hour, be live in Istanbul, live in Harare, live in Johannesburg. We try to ask all the questions that listeners want answers to. You get that opportunity to question people in power. Newsday is different because it not only hears from the big names making the news, it also gives voice to those affected by the news. You get to speak to really interesting people and they have such good stories to tell. Because there is simply a human interest in what's going on around the world that we can't stop talking about. Join us for Newsday, weekdays at 3, 6 and 8 GMT. Still to come on the Arts Hour on tour in Jerusalem with me, Nikki Beatty, Palestinian rapper Mohammed Mograbi performs for us. And the man of the moment, Leo Raz, creator and star of the biggest Israeli TV show ever, Fauda, is here too. There was someone that uh, took Fauda and they showed it to 20 uh, Arab guys. In the beginning, they thought that it's an, a Palestinian show. They didn't understand that it's an Israeli show. All that and more coming up on the Arts Hour stage here in Jerusalem. BBC News with David Austin. President Putin has ordered an inquiry into the Russian military plane crash into the Black Sea. 
The crash happened shortly after the aircraft took off from Sochi on its way to Syria. None of the more than 90 people on board survived. A day of mourning has been declared on Monday. In his traditional Christmas Day address at the Vatican, Pope Francis has called for new efforts to bring peace between Israelis and Palestinians. And the leader of the world's Anglicans, the Archbishop of Canterbury, urged people to look to God to chase away the fear of terror. The Israeli leader, Benjamin Netanyahu, has ordered his foreign ministry to summon and reprimand the ambassadors from countries on the UN Security Council. Mr Netanyahu is furious that the UN voted on Friday to condemn Israel's building of Jewish settlements in the occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem. There's been a powerful earthquake off the coast of Chile. The US Geological Survey said the quake had a magnitude of 7.7 and that the epicentre was 200 kilometres southwest of the city of Puerto Montt. A tsunami warning has been issued for the region. There are no details so far of damage or casualties. A powerful typhoon, Noc 10, also known as Nina, is lashing the Philippines with sustained wind speeds of up to 235 kilometres per hour. There are fears that the typhoon could hit the country's most densely populated areas, including the capital, Manila. France has confirmed that a French aid worker has been kidnapped in northern Mali. The French foreign ministry said Sophie Petronin was abducted in the northern town of Gao. It said she ran an organisation that helps children suffering from malnutrition. And Queen Elizabeth has praised the achievements of Commonwealth athletes at the Rio Olympic and Paralympic Games. Apart from Britain, she highlighted Grenada, the Bahamas, Jamaica and New Zealand. And that's the latest BBC News. Welcome back to the Arts Hour on Tour in Jerusalem. I'm Nikki Beatty and we're on stage at the Cinematheque in the west of the city celebrating Hanukkah, Christmas and the Nativity marked by Christians and Muslims alike. We've also just had the winter solstice and we can celebrate anything else you want really. Coming up in this half of the show, live performances from Palestinian rapper Mohammed Mugrabi and Israeli band Hadag Nahash. I'll be talking to my new favorite actor, Jerusalem-born Leo Raz, writer, creator, and star of the outstanding Israeli television series Founder, and Shifra Kornfeld, Riman Barakat, Apo Sagian, and Ite Mautna are still with us. Comedy first, though. Put your hands together, if you will, for one of the stars from the local English-speaking comedy scene here, Benji Lovett. Thank you, thank you, Jerusalem. How are you, Jerusalem? Yeah, great to be here. And by the way, in Jerusalem, BBC stands for Better Bring Hummus. So who's celebrating Christmas this week? Celebrating Christmas? Yeah, okay. Christians, I love you. But I gotta ask, how do you celebrate Christmas here? First of all, we have no chimneys. I don't know how you're getting your gifts. Certainly not through the postal service. And you know that the second Santa Claus gets into Israeli airspace, he's definitely getting shot down by the Iron Dome. So they're not going to get that abroad, so that was just for you guys. Guys, I'm in a great mood. I recently celebrated my 10-year anniversary of immigrating to Jerusalem. Thank you. So I'm so glad you clapped, because a lot of people here don't get it. How many people have no clue why anyone would ever leave America and come to the Middle East? Because when I was a tourist, sales mode. Oh, Jerusalem is great. The people, the history. We are family. After, we were joking. <laughs> you believed us? Why you want to live here? Like, what happened to the other guy? He moved to New York. Because <laughs> do you feel safe here in Jerusalem? Yeah. Of course. I feel so safe. So many people who've never been, they don't know. They watch the news, they don't understand. They think this place is a war zone. They think it's a desert. My friends in the States are like, Benji, you live in Jerusalem. Do you ride a camel to school? What are you, a moron? I'm an adult, I ride a camel to work. I'm not going to Jerusalem, it's dangerous. Yeah, but you go to the mall on Black Friday, so. It's just an Xbox, calm down. Well, we love it here, we do, the home to three religions. If you've never been, you have to come. I mean, clearly you gotta go to the old city. Of course, you got to go to museums. But Nikki, you discover this yourself. If there's one place you got to go to really understand the Middle Eastern mentality, it has got to be the open air market, Shuk Machane Yehuda. <laughs> or as I call it, Dirty Walmart. <laughs> How do you explain the Shuk to someone who's never been? 
there's everything. The most amazing sights and smells and foods, but a little bit different service from what you might be used to in the West. I would love to see a job interview with someone who works at the Shook. Okay, your resume is excellent. Can you scream for 10 hours a day? Okay, can you dangle your cigarette over the food? Is that gonna be a problem? You're gonna need a little more chest hair coming out of your shirt if that's possible. How much enthusiasm can you have about produce? Agvanyot, tomatoes, 10 shekel, agvanyot. Dude, your tomatoes are the same as his. Hey, you have to buy agvanyot, I have to feed my family. Feed him agvanyot. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much, Jerusalem, you were a blast. <laughs> Benji, love it. Thank you so very much. More live performance now on the Arts Hour as we welcome Mohammed Mugrabi, a.k.a. Jabed. said what is going on where is the love and all the humanity gone who is responsible i don't care i just want to feel secure here and there palestine is on my mind all the time israel too is on my mind all the time who is right who is wrong i don't want to get into this and the truth is that people can live together no matter where no matter who no matter how first of all we need to get rid of the control of the minds of the people and destroy all the walls you have to face it because nobody was born racist the fact is that our ideology raised it on all of us are victims of the system think what you can get and what you got trust me i don't create another i want you to say something with me are you ready salua nabi salua nabi salua nabi salua nabi salua nabi salua nabi ما بدناش حرب ما بدناش الضرب بين بني ادم على الارض بحلم بحياه فيش فيها جنود فيش فيها حدود فيها كتير ورود وناسها بعيشوا عشان عمرو كلها امل ولا مره بتدمروا بتاخد زي ما بتعطي بتعطي زي ما بتاخد بتزمهاش مؤتمرات وتعاهد لا امتى بدنا نضل تحت السيطره خايفين من الموت يجي من ورا انا بكره كل واحد سياسي هو واصحابه القاعدين على الكراسي ولا كروح خلص اطلع من راسي بكفيش ما شفنا مقاسي الانسان انسان وين ما كان حتى لو كان بغزه او لبنان We gotta do it once again صلوا على النبي اه يلا صلوا على النبي 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 Right, I'm a Palestinian refugee, and that's why I got my energy. I'ma do it right, no, don't do it wrong. I'm going to start in my peace right here. I'll send my love everywhere. Join the air, no, no more fear, no. No matter what happens, just keep smiling. Believe in love and love everything. Come on, work it, let me see you work it. Clap your hands in the air and sing it. Celebrate and start peace right here. No matter where, cause peace starts here. Deep inside me, I'm feeling it. When I look in your eyes, I can see it. So come and do it, it's easy to get it. Yalla, bring it, make it, spread it everywhere. Can my mother once again, Salo Anabi? Are you ready? Yo, uh, Salo Anabi. Salo Anabi. Salo Anabi. Salo Anabi. Yo, thank you. Mohammed, Javid, what is Salu Anabi? You've made us sing it, now you have to explain it. So it's an Arabic expression, actually. It's a slang that means uh, like, cool take down. Take a deep breath. <laughs> take a yeah. deep breath, calm down. Thank you so much, Mohammed. So you're listening to The Arts Hour on tour in Jerusalem at the Cinematheque. I'm Nikki Beatty, and now to Leo Raz, man of the moment on television here and beyond Israel too, as his extraordinary show, Fauda, is streaming on Netflix. Fauda means chaos in Arabic, and this is the show breaking viewership records amongst both Israelis and Palestinians. The premise... An Israeli undercover unit is tracking a Palestinian activist, and during their pursuit, suicide bombings, kidnappings, and undercover operations unfold. 
It's high tension, high drama, high anxiety for me, to be honest. And it taps into the grey, not black and white nature of the Palestinian and Israeli political situation. Here's a clip. <laughs> Leo Raz stars as Doron, the commander of an undercover Israeli unit. Leo, how closely does the role of Doron relate to your own experiences? Because you were in the Special Forces, weren't you? Yeah, I used to be in the Special Forces when I was in the Army. And, um, you know, eight years ago, I went to the psychologist for the first time in my life because I was getting married, so I was scared. And, <laughs> and I asked him if we can sit the opposite way because I want to sit that I can see the door in front of me. And he said, okay, listen, let's talk about your other problem now. <laughs> and he said that I have PTSD. It's post-traumatic disorder. And I think 75% of Israelis and Arabs and Jews have it. If, when you are in a war zone, you have it. And I really wanted to talk about this issue in this TV show. Doron have it. Doron don't know it and is not recognize it. And mm. uh, just I didn't till I was writing this show. So you had PTSD in common with this character, various yeah. other... Are you happily married now, then? Is yeah, it all yeah, going yeah. well? Sure, sure, sure. Good, yeah. good, I have good. three kids and... Uh, Excellent. Good to know. Oh, if that gets yeah. a round of applause. <laughs> In My wife knows me better now because of the show, so... Really? Yeah, 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 yeah. She's got insights into your deepest yeah, psycho... Yeah. Wow. Yeah. In the show, the unit are disguised as Palestinians. They speak Arabic, they practice Arabic customs, they live in Palestinian communities. They blend in so that they can kill or catch anyone they suspect. The dialogue is 75% Arabic. How long did it take you to learn all that? Uh, first of all, uh, actually, these kind of units, um, people don't know it, but the Israeli army made them because they, they didn't want to have a lot of casualties. It's just a little tiny uh, few people going into a place, take prisoner, one prisoner, one terrorist out of it, instead of bombing, uh, I don't know, a house or something. So it's, it's very important for me to say that. And Arabic. My father is from Iraq. Ah. Yeah. My mother from Algeria. And my father called himself Arab Jew. Okay. Because they were born there, they, they lived there, and they, we, we, they were speaking Arabic at home. We were speaking Arabic at home. I was listening to Arabic at home. Well, you know when you're doing the ablutions uh, in the mosque, so mm. you're washing behind your yeah. ears, and that whole beautiful ceremony, all the cast had to learn these sort of rituals, I suppose, yeah. did they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I used to learn for uh, six months before we were shooting. I went every day to, uh, to Jaffa. And I, I learned Arabic with uh, an amazing uh, Arab guy. And uh, it was with a specific dialect from Ramallah. And it's very different from the north. So I had to practice it. Uh, my wife hated me that time of year because uh, in the radio, there was just radio, Arab radio. <laughs> radio Al-Uts, Radio Ramallah, Radio... Uh, <laughs> it was amazing because now, you know, Israeli uh, uh, Palestinians that live in Israel, they know Hebrew. You know Hebrew very good, right? Mohammed. Yeah, you can speak fluent Hebrew. Yeah. But <laughs> if I ask those people here, nobody knows Arabic, the oh. Jews. Shwaye, oh, shwaye, yeah. it's because you go to the market, so you say shwaye. <laughs> what does shwaye mean? It's a uh, little. Okay. No, but, but it's a big problem, in my opinion. And now, because of this show, people are starting to learn Arabic because it became very sexy. So yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's amazing. No, no, it's amazing. And the, the series depicts the two sides of the story. So we see Doron hunting down Hamas activist Abu Ahmed, also known as the Panther. But we also see the tragic life and the family life of Abu Ahmed. And I wonder whether you're using your art, television, to talk about the stuff it's otherwise too hard to talk about. Sure, sure. I think uh, for us, for all the writers, it was quite a healing process. And we talked about things that nobody talks. And, you, and when, we show, when we're showing the bad guys, or even the bad guys have families and have life and have kids, and they love their kids as well as we do. And we wanted to show it, and we want to show the people that not everything is black and white, that even the black, it's a little bit gray, mm -hmm. and the white is a little bit uh, black. And I think we did good 
because I know I'm getting m emails from all over the world now, from the Arab world and from the, Is from the Israel and from the West uh, world. You think Fauda pushes both sides to ask questions and view the other more closely? Sure. And uh, um, I'll tell you, there was someone that uh, took Fauda and they showed it in Ramallah to 20 uh, guys, uh, Arab guys. And the in the beginning, they thought that it's an, a Palestinian show. They didn't understood that it's an Israeli show. Where did you actually film the show? In Kfar Qasem. It's uh, 10 minutes driving from Tel Aviv. But you filmed this during what's known as Operation Protective Edge. In Hebrew, Zuk Eitan. What did that actually mean? Were you in danger? Did, were you forced to leave at any point? I will tell you. Uh, in the beginning, actually, in the first day, we didn't want to shoot there. We were afraid. We didn't know how people will react to, uh, you know, 180 uh, Israelis, Jews, and Arabs coming to, uh, to Arab village. It's an Arab Israeli village. So with the first day, we, didn't, we canceled the shooting, and it's a lot of money. And at, at night, the mayor of Kfar Qasem called us, and he said, listen, you talked with me about, uh, how do you say, dukium? Um, coexistence. Coexistence. Let's coexist now and during the war. And I said, okay, you're right. And we just, at, at that night, everyone came to uh, Kfar Qasem, and it was amazing. The hospitality was amazing. And it was quite crazy because there's missiles going down on us, Arab and Jews together. You know, the missile don't know if you are Arab or Jew, uh, Muslim or Jew. And um, we were all together getting to the shelters. That there are no shelters but uh, holes in the ground. We were in the, and it, we were in just kind of a bubble, creative bubble, uh, of Arabs and Jews working together during the war. It was amazing. It was, uh, I was just like in a dream for a month and a half. The response has been amazing. Has there been any controversy at all? No. <laughs> no. Well, that's extraordinary. I'm sorry. Yeah. Don't be. I think this is, you know, this is what we're talking about today. Yeah. Now, we're in Jerusalem, Leo, and you were born here. How do you think it's influenced your creativity? Jerusalem, it's, um, it's a city of walls. And to be creative, I think you have to have walls surrounding you because you have to to shout, you have to fight, you have to do some stuff. And it was, it's very hard, it's an it's, it's amazing city, but everything here is very extreme. The people, everything is very extreme, to everything. And I think to be, to live here, you feel, you smell, the creativity coming, come to you from all of, from everywhere. Leo know? Raz, thank you so much. Thank you. thank you. And may series two of Fowler be even better. And in the meantime, for all of you listening, you can catch season one on Netflix. Fauda is a great example of the culture of collaboration happening in Israel. So I want to know what else is going on that's really working in the arts in terms of perhaps a culture of collaboration. Apo, can I come to you first? Uh, I don't specifically know if there is an actual collaboration going on across the divide, but I do think that people are starting to realize that you can't really escape the proximity. And I think people are starting to check out what the other side is doing. And I think that's very important. So something's moving. Itai. I wanted to connect to what Apo is uh, talking about because last season that we had in the Jerusalem season of culture, we had these journeys into the city which, are, which were called dissolving boundaries. Leo was speaking very beautifully about the walls that we have here. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we got a lot of walls here. Physical but also mental walls that we put into our minds when we label somebody as Palestinian, as religious, as non-religious, as Tel Avivian, as Jerusalem, whatever. So how is that happening? Give me an example. Well, what we did last year were journeys that people signed up for a five-hour journey into the city. They did not know where they were going. They only knew that it could be only in the light rail or by walking or by a bus. And then they crossed the city from east to west. They went to Shuafat and they went to the other neighborhoods and they met religious people and non-religious people, most of them actors or artists or activists or social entrepreneurs and Riman was one of them, of course, and then suddenly you understand that the image of what a Palestinian is or what an Israeli is, is a total different image when you meet them in their houses, in their studios, in their places. So that's a trend that's going on, I hope. Riman, I'm going to come to you. Yeah, actually, as uh, Muhammad was uh, performing, I had an insight and also like I remembered why have I uh, started working and creating uh, collaborations with, with Israelis. 
And the context in which, uh, for example, Muhammad comes from, and the context in which, for me, uh, as I grew up, uh, being separated from people from in, in West Jerusalem, but also a couple couple of years ago with uh, Tsukaitan, the the separation I felt in the city, it hurt so much that I really w sought to. Uh, seek a, a relationship with the other side. And I think that's kind of like what, what, what the, the trend I'm seeing, that it really hurts so much that this, this fear, this, uh, this anger uh, is, is not making us sort of at ease with ourselves to the extent that we must do something about it and go beyond, find a way to go beyond the current situation. Shifra. When Leo says that um, Jerusalem is a city of walls, um, I grew up within the old city of Jerusalem. I grew up in the Jewish quarter, and Apo and I lived on the same street. And we are meeting tonight for the first time on this stage. Wow. And this brings me to think about um, the secret walls and the secret boundaries, which are so much harder to cross because... Obvious walls, you can run up against them, you can try and cross them in many ways because they're there for you to see and fight against. And then the secret walls, and Jerusalem is full of them. You walk down the street and then you don't notice and you're in a completely diff different neighborhood. And through the Jerusalem season of culture, I have found every year a new encounter that I would never have thought of myself a couple years ago. I found myself spending four days in a row in the house of a woman um, who's my age, we could have, should have known and met in many different ways, but she's ultra-Orthodox, and I left that world, and I would never think of going back to visit her. And this is a completely invisible wall. This isn't a wall I have to ask anyone for permission to cross. I'm not breaking any rules, and yet I would have never gone there without this vessel. Groups are hard to change, but individuals can cross lines all the time, and maybe that's what's happening secretly in Jerusalem. Everyone here is probably across some kind of line that they cross tonight or at some point in their life to be sitting here listening to all of us because this is not the mainstream conversation and it's a pleasure to be a part of it. Mm. It's about having multiple identities. We're not only the formal image that we hold. We're much more than that. And I think Jerusalem, because it has so many different identities, is a real good laboratory for that. Can I tell you about my favorite place in Jerusalem? I would love you to tell us about your favorite place <laughs> in Jerusalem. <laughs> to go from my home in the old city, you must know this, Apo, to the center, to downtown. I have to walk through Jaffa Gate. Mm -hmm. And then there's this one crosswalk where every single time I stood at that um, crosswalk, there would be a nun and a priest and an Arab woman. And I would stop and look to my side and count the rich diversity of the people sharing this crosswalk with me. And then we'd continue to different parts of the city, but it was this one split second where it was always like a complete array of the city's different identities. Can I, can I? Yes, Apo, and I, wanted, I also wanted to ask you, you go ahead first and then I'll ask right. you a question. I agree with a lot of things that were said here, but I do think that uh, the city lacks platforms where that identities can actually meet, like an accessible platform. And I don't want to do a PR thing here, but in our band, <laughs> we do, no, no, but we do make sure that our, that our band and our activities and our platform is accessible, even if it's uh, a linguistic accessibility. We do most things in English because we do recognize that uh, one side of the city will not speak the other side of the city, but then they can all come together when it's in English. Okay. And uh, th there are a lot of identities, and the potential is vast, but as long as we lack the platforms where, they, uh, where those identities can meet and, uh, and explore the potential, we might lose the chance for all those collaborations. Thank you so much. <laughs> As the Earth's Hour on tour from Jerusalem needs to come to an end, it just remains for me to thank all our guests, my producer Nikki Pexman and all the BBC team here, and the Cinema Tech for having us. Our next stop is Jaipur, India in January. To end the show, though, the truly fabulous Hadag Nahash are going to play... What are you going to play? Hinaniba. And what does that mean? It means here I come, it's a song about leaving Jerusalem for Tel Aviv, then going back, then going back again, leaving back again, coming back again, never deciding. Excellent. Take it away. Let's do it. 
You're with the BBC World Service, where every year we try to predict the future. 2016. It was a year that will live long in the memory. And as these 12 months draw to a close, we bring together some of the BBC's top correspondents for our annual look ahead. Join me, Owen Bennett-Jones, as we predict who and what will be making the headlines in 2017. Correspondents Look Ahead, Friday at 9 and 23 GMT. You're listening to the BBC World Service. There's no live sport today as it's Christmas Day here in the UK. The players return to the pitch tomorrow. Find the fixtures and results at bbcworldservice.com. In an hour, we return to Rio to see what's changed after the 2016 Olympic and Paralympic Games. This is the BBC World Service, the world's radio station. Hello and welcome. This is the History Hour with me, Max Pearson, the past brought to life by those who were there. This week, the accidental death of an anarchist, the true story that inspired Dario Fo's play. The Christmas presents were open and on the floor. Claudia ran right in and wanted to chat to them, but my mum stopped her saying, no, they are policemen. That was when my mother told us Daddy had been stopped, but that he would be home soon. 
but we never saw him again. Also, we've got the commander of the first American mission to go round the moon. And we remember two towering figures from the world of art, the film director Derek Jarman. He would say, I know nothing about acting. I'm not sure what I know about films. Of course, you see, he had such an engaging personality. It was just wonderful to meet a real rebel. And the Irish writer Samuel Beckett. Beckett was one of the few people I've ever met who just really knew that as long as he was alive, his purpose was to write. First, we'll have a bulletin of today's world news. Hello, this is David Austin with the BBC News. A major search and recovery operation is underway in the Black Sea after a Russian military plane crash in which all 92 people on board are presumed dead. The Russian authorities have deployed over 30 vessels as well as divers and helicopter teams to locate the wreckage of the plane. President Vladimir Putin has ordered an inquiry. Steve Rosenberg is in Moscow. The Tupolev 154 had taken off from a military airfield near Moscow. Its final destination was Syria, but the plane stopped in Sochi to refuel. Minutes after taking off again, it vanished from radar screens. On board the aircraft were more than 60 members of the Russian army's world-famous song and dance ensemble, the Alexandrov Troop. They'd been travelling to Syria to entertain Russian troops there. Nine Russian journalists, too, lost their lives. And a prominent humanitarian activist and charity worker, Yelizaveta Glinka, was known to millions of Russians as Dr Lisa. Pope Francis has called for an end to the fighting in Syria, saying it's time for weapons to be silent forever. In his traditional Christmas Day address at the Vatican...